biggest problems were too many feathers. So not only were we type like feather janitors, but we were also feather hairdressers. We go in and cut feathers from the bird. Yeah, we pluck feathers from the bird. That was one of our major tasks. <laughs> um, for instance, a shot over here that we were working on. You know, Margalo and Stewart, they're at a sports event, and she's got a foam hand. But um, in one of the frames, you can see this uh, feather that's kind of poking out. But a lot of times we'll want to just like identify and pluck a feather like that. Each feather has a number associated with it, and using these images, you can get the number of the feather. And then once you have the number, you can put it in an, a list to have it turned off. Feather number 22037. <laughs> that's one that's going to be put on our list that we're going to take it out. In this case, when she flies up, we want that feather back. So we'll have it off for most of the frame range. And then when she takes off the foam glove, there's that, you know, we can turn it back on. And then that prevents there from being, you know, holes in the bird and that type of thing. They keep going, they keep going, they keep going, look that way. And it's a big hook. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got it. We uh, have a fantastic costume designer, uh, Mona May, who has injected a lot of uh, color into the little slice. We're still planning this. Wait, okay, for the change. Yeah, I like this one. What is this for? He's the smallest actor that I've ever dressed. He's about four and a half inches tall. And after, you know, many sketches and many fittings with him, digital fittings, uh, we really find the best proportions for him uh, to make him look handsome and beautiful, you know, as everybody else in the cast. The wardrobe is extraordinarily expensive and literally it can cost $100,000 to even think about uh, having Stuart change his shirt for the next scene. In Stuart Little 1, we're dealing with probably about six costume changes. And in Stuart Little 2, we're dealing with probably about 12 to 16 costume changes. So in the first movie, he was wearing a lot more of simple, like, um, T-shirt and pants. And now in this movie, he has costumes that have backpacks and other accessories. One of the things that, that a lot of people don't realize is that anytime Stuart interacts with an object, if he picks it up, if he rides it, if he's, he's playing with it, all of that is modeled as a computer version. In the scene where Stuart rides the skateboard, we actually built a digital skateboard. They're telling us this could be one shot of Stuart spinning on top of it, but my experience has always been when they tell you you'll never see it, build it anyways because they end up seeing it, and you see the underside mid-screen, right in dead view. So it was really good that we built all the detail on the underside. One of the challenges of CG animation compared to traditional is the use of props. Uh, props in traditional animation, you just draw a piece of popcorn. Here it became a much bigger issue because you have to lock the popcorn into his hand and then you can move his hand and the popcorn will move with it. I'll go to animation support and I'll say, I want him to take a bite of this popcorn. And they will go through and figure out, okay, it needs to be able to be locked to his hand, to move off of his hand, and to animate in between the bite. They will set all of that up, thankfully, and explain it to me so that I can animate it in the, sh in the shot. This sequence is called the ED sequence, the evening date. It's probably the sequence I'm most proud of overall that I got to lead on the film. Ana Alvarez was doing Margolo and I was doing Stuart. It was a pretty rare opportunity to do something where he's just really nervous and trying to impress a girl. Boy, I'm really glad you fell into my car. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not glad you fell. I, I, I just... What's my popcorn? Okay. <laughs> Our job is really to bring the life visually that the vocal performer has given us. You saved my life. Taking Melanie Griffith's voice, using that as a starting point, and then getting as much of that personality into the performance as we can, and then from there, add in the little bird nuances and so forth. So this breaks down the basic walk cycle for Margot. And as it turns out, she didn't really walk that much in the film. So the hop cycle seemed to be the more appropriate type of action. There's these little twitches and flutters and all the things that you can insert into the animation to make her more believable. There's a lot of information here about flight, 
It's basically a 16 frame cycle and it's going through a series of poses, a scooping forward like a swimmer and then almost into a tuck pose on the upstroke. Then when they render it in digital, it's a subtle thing, but it renders as you would imagine it rendered in reality when it was actually filmed through a camera's lens. This is one of the more complex effect shots. There's a lot of elements that go into making this final product here. This is the original background image. It's just Margolo. This is one pass. There's several different passes of Margolo to get specular highlights and sort of the sheen and the wet look. This is like the specular highlights as the water um, ripples out from Margolo and the drops in it. This is Margolo's reflection on the surface of the water. Here's one of the passes used for the drops that she shakes off her body. Water itself has pen layers, three more for the drops. The falcon comes in and changes the water lighting, changes the drops lighting. So it's like a lot of interaction. Did you really think I wouldn't find out? Well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about you and your little mouse friend. The falcon has uh, very unique patterns on all of his feathers. Every one of his feathers has some sort of pattern, whether it's a teardrop shape or a little stripe across it, 40 or so different patterns that we could apply to the falcon. We created a pattern map, which was a, uh, a texture map that went over the uh, surface of the bird, and it would basically outline the different areas of the bird that had the different kinds of, of feathers. In this film, Stewart gets a digital airplane. They had a prop airplane to start with, and ultimately they replaced the prop airplane for a lot of the shots with a digital version of the airplane. And then later on in the film, he repairs it. And from that point on in the film, it's an entirely digital airplane. The airplane itself has a lot of character. You can see the wing wobbling, pieces wiggling off the side here. Even the wing is shuddering. There were dozens of controls on the plane to cause it to shake. As far as the flight characteristics of the airplane, we had an animator uh, working on Stuart who was an ex Israeli Air Force pilot. His name was Yair Cantor, and he went around and told us all about ailerons and elevators and rudders. When the animator finishes with the scene, this is what you look at during dailies. In computer animation, there's a tremendous jump between what the animator does and then when the digital department finishes. I just saw this, this middle scene for the first time today. I was just amazed. Even when the claws come through the wing, the digital department, the little pieces flying out. Oh, my God. Oh, baby. A mouse needs to know his limitation. They did all these little subtle touches. It was just amazing. Of course, the wind blowing the fur. You know, even working in this field, when you see something like that, it's like, whoa, it's hard to believe that they can do stuff like that. It almost seems like everything we're doing on this film now didn't seem very possible before. We used to talk about doing animated movies, and it wasn't rocket science, but the truth is, now it is. Because when you're doing CGI with reflection and fur and feathers, the, the, literally the amount of data that you're crunching through a computer is enormous. My job is to light the shot and to light um, all our computer-generated elements so that they match the background plate. And this one is actually a combination of several different elements in order to get the background. One is a matte painting that our painting department did. One is a, a wide shot of New York City, of the harbor. And another one is uh, this foreground of the barge, which was actually shot on a stage with a motion control camera. And there's the plane itself. Another stage is deformations. As the plane rolls over, we want it to look like the plane is uh, deforming the, the cardboard as it, as it moves along. And so if you look closely and imagine that the plane is moving here, you can see the, the movement of the cardboard as if the wheels are rolling over it. This is uh, what it looks like at the stage when I receive the shot. And so it goes from this stage into this. I eat because I know in my growling gut if anything happens to you I'll be blamed. Nathan is wonderful he's great to work with he's really a comic genius his uh, improvisations everything about uh, Nathan is uh, really wonderful. Come on it's Wednesday we can take it a matinee is Cat still playing? <laughs>
<laughs> we tend to record the actors throughout the whole process, so we don't just do one session. It tends to be broken up to, into at least ten that we'll do from the very beginning of production and then all the way through until uh, well into post-production. What about me? How the hell am I going to get down from here? Sometimes we can't actually uh, get in the same room with the, the actors, and so we'll do uh, long-distance uh, telephone hookups. And In this case, uh, we did Nathan in New York, and uh, we were here in Los Angeles. Hey, Snow, buddy, are you two still friends, or can I eat him? No, Monty, you can't eat him. Please. As you can see here, I have Monty and Snowbell that are the characters uh, for story level two. So when you go to muscles, you can uh, you can access to, for example, all the all the mouth muscles. We have like a kind of 120 muscles. We call them face shapes. We'll make over 50 face shapes for each creature. We'll go from you know happy to sad to frown and just left and right side of the head. And those can all be combined to create basically any kind of reaction or any face shape you want. Well, we shoot the live action cat and then we replace his face. So we actually do animation manipulation on his features, on his eyes, his mouth. Um, but the rest of him is real. Prince is his real name. We looked at close to 5,000 cats for this show. And when we did Stuart Little One, and we actually rejected Snowbell twice. We took him only to be a stand-in on the movie. We had another cat that was cast in the lead that we thought was going to be the cat and was working, but as we got into our training six months, Snowbell just outshined them all. I asked Rob when we made the first movie, I said, well, why is the mouse our son but the cat is our pet? And he said, don't ask me. <laughs> it's because it was that way in the book. See, Ruffy, up, see, on your mark. We have five stand-ins for Snowbell. All the five Snowbells are amazing at what they do. One climbs, one runs, one's good close-up one. One can be held, one can like, jump. I mean, the cats have to do pretty hard work. Snowbell does his own stunts, as do I. I don't do any of my own acting. I do all my own stunts, and Snowbell's much the same. I hope I live to regret this. Oh. In the movie, there's the Pishkin building, which is a building that doesn't exist in New York. We've created it. We started out knowing that uh, they wanted to find a really unique place where the bad guy lives, where uh, the Falcon is going to have his home. So they did a lot of scouting and just couldn't find the perfect building in New York. So we decided to just design one and uh, build it primarily in the computer. Like, for instance, in this example right here, we were actually able to use a real building that we shot in New York for the lowest half, just this first story here. And then all the rest was digitally extended. We at Imageworks had just completed the film Spider-Man, so it was a perfect opportunity to leverage off some of the work, because they had just finished building 21 buildings that were all computer-generated that Spider-Man could swing between. And so we were able to use some of their techniques of uh, making complicated, repetitious surfaces and some of their texturing techniques. And even, uh, you know, an air conditioning unit or two was actually shared between the shows. Careful now. One step at a time. That's it. You're gonna make it. Yeah.